And now he stood at the end of the long part of the lake and was not the same, would not be the same again. There were many first days, first arrow days, when he had used the thread from the tattered old piece of windbreaker and some pitch from a stump to put slivers of feathers on a dry willow shaft and make an arrow that would fly correctly. Not accurately. He never got really good with it, but correctly so that if a rabbit or a fool bird sat in one place long enough, close enough, and he had enough arrows, he could kill it. He that brought first rabbit day. He killed one of the large rabbits with an arrow and skinned, skinned it as, as the fool bird, cooked the same way and found the meat was good. Not as rich as the bird, but still good. And there were strips of fat on the back that the rabbit cooked into the meat that back of the rabbit that cooked into the meat and made it richer. Now he had back and forth between the rabbits and the fool birds when he could, filling it with fish in the middle, always hungry. I'm always hungry, but I can do it now. I can get food. I know I can get food and make more. I know what I can do. He moved closer and closer to the lake to stand on a nut brush and in the thick brushes there was a stickler pod with green nuts nuts that he thought he might be able to eat but they weren't ripe yet as he was out for a fool bird and they liked to hide in the back of the thick part of the nut brush back and where the stems were closer and provided cover in the second clump he saw a bird moved close to it paused when it had feathers came, come up and made a sound like a cricket a sound sign like an alarm just before it flew then it moved closer when the feathers went down and the bird relaxed he did this four times never looking at the bird directly moving towards it at an angle and that seemed um, that it seemed he was pushing that it seemed he was moving off to the side he had perfected this method after many attempts and it worked so well that he usually caught one of the caught one with his bare hands until he was standing less than three feet from the bird which was frozen in a hiding attitude in the brush the bird held for him and he put the arrow to the bird one of the feathered arrows not a fish arrow and drew and released it was a clear miss and he took another arrow out of the cloth pouch himself but made it from a piece of, of windbreaker which he'd made from a piece of windbreaker sleeve tied one at the end to make a bottom the fool bird sat still for him and he still did not look directly at it until he drew the second arrow and aimed to release the mist again this time the bird jerked a bit from the arrow stuck next to it so close in the brush almost and that it almost brushed his breast brian had seen brian had two more arrows and debated moving slowly to, ch to change the spear over to his right hand and use that to kill the bird. One more shot, he decided, and he would try again. He slowly brought out another arrow out, put it in the string, and aimed to release, and this time saw a flurry of feathers, and that meant that he had a hit. The bird had been struck off-center and was flopping wildly. Brian jumped on it and grabbed it and slammed it against the ground once, sharply to kill it. Then he stood and retrieved his arrows. Make sure they were all right and went down to the lake to wash the blood off his hands. He kneeled at the water's edge and put the dead bird and his weapons down and dipped his hands into the water. It was very nearly the last act of his life. Later, he would not know why he had started to turn, some smell or sound, a tiny brushing sound, but something caught his ear or nose and began to turn and his head half around when he saw a brown wall of fur detach itself from the forest to his rear and come down on him like a runaway truck. He had just time to see it was a moose. He knew them from the pictures but did not know, could not have guessed how large they were. When it hit him, it was a cow and she had no horns, but she took him uh, in the left side of the back and forehead she took him and threw him into the water and then came after him to finish the job he had another half second to fill his lungs with air and she was on him again using her head 
to drive him down in the mud to the bottom. Insane, he thought. Just one word and say, mud filled his eyes, his ears, and the horn boss of the moose on the moose drove him deeper and deeper into the bottom muck until suddenly it was over and he felt alone. He sputtered to the surface, sucking air in fright and panic, and he wiped the mud and water out of his eyes and cleared them. He saw a cow standing sideways at him, not ten feet away, calmly chewing lily pad root. She did not appear to even see him, and she didn't care about him. And Brian carefully and be Brian turned carefully and began to swim crawl out of the water. As soon as he moved, the hair on his back went up, and she charged to begin using her head and front hooves this time, slamming him back into the water on the back this time. He screamed his air, screamed the air out of his lungs and hammered on her head with his fists and filled his throat with water and she left again. Once more he came to the surface, but he was hurt now, hurt inside, hurt in his ribs and stayed hunched over, pretending to be dead. She was standing again eating brian studied her out of one eye looking at the bank with the other wondering how seriously he was injured wondering if she would let him go this time insane he started to move ever slowly her head turned and her back went up like a brown hair on an angry dog and he stopped took a slow breath and the hair went down and she ate move hair up stop hair down move hair up a half foot at a time until He was at the edge of the water. He stayed on his hands and knees. Indeed, was hurt, so it wasn't sure he could walk anyway. And what seemed to accept had been, and she seemed to accept that and let him crawl slowly out of the water and up to the trees and brush. When he, when he was behind a tree, he stood carefully, took stock. Legs seemed to be all right, but his ribs were hurt bad. He could only take short breaths and had jabbing pains, and right, his right shoulder seemed to be wrenched somehow. And also, his bow and spear and fool bird were in the water. At least he could walk, and he and just about decided to leave everything he could. At least he could walk, and he had just about decided to leave everything when the cow moved out deeper, the deeper water and left him. As quickly as she come, walking down the shoreline in the shallow water, her legs making sucking sounds, and when she pulled them free of mud, hanging on a pine limb, she'd watched her. He'd watched her go, half expecting her to t to come over and run him over again. But she kept going, and she was well gone from sight when he went to the bank and found the bird. Then waded out a bit to get his bow and spear. Neither of them were broken, and the arrows, incredibly, were still in the belt pouch, although messed up with the mud and the water. It took almost an hour for him to work his way back around the lake his legs worked well enough but it was he took two or three steps he would begin to deeply breathe for, uh, to breathe deeply and the pain from the ribs would stop him and he would lean against a tree until he saw tell he could slow back down to shallow breathing he had done she had done more damage than he originally thought that insane count no sense at all just madness when he got to the shelter, he crawled inside and was grateful that the coals were still glowing and that he had thought to get wood first in the morning to be ready for the day. Grateful that he had thought to get enough wood for two or three days at a time. Grateful they had fish nearby if he needed to eat. Grateful, finally, as he dozed off, that he was alive. So insane, he thought, letting sleep cover the pain of his chest as an insane attack for no reason, and he fell asleep with his mind trying to make the moose have a reason. The noise awakened him. It was a low sound, a low roar sound that came from the wind. His eyes snapped open, not because it was loud, but because it was new, and he felt the wind in his shelter, through the, felt the rain that had come through the wind, and heard the thunder many times in the past 47 days, but not this, not this noise. Low, almost alive, almost a throat somehow, the sound, the noise, was a roar. A far off roar, but coming at him. And finally he was awake, and he sat up in the darkness, grimacing from the pain 
from his ribs. The pain was different now, a tightening pain. It seemed much, and it seemed less, but the sound, so strange, he thought, a mystery sound, a spirit sound, a bad sound. He had a small, he took some small wood and got the fire going again, but felt little comfort and cheer from the flames, but also felt that he should get ready. He did not know how, but he should get ready. The sound was coming for him, just for him, and he was getting ready. The sound wanted him. He found the spear and bow where they were hanging on the pegs of the shelter of the wall and brought his weapons to his bed uh, he made out of pine boughs. Bows. More comfort, but like comfort of the flames, it didn't work, and the new threat uh, that he didn't understand yet. Restless uh, threat, he thought, and stood out of the shelter from the flames to study the sky. It was dark. The sound meant something for him, something from his memory, something he had read about, something he had seen on television, something he thought, oh no. Uh, it was it was wind, wind like the sound of a train and the low belly roar of a train. It was a tornado. That was it. The roar of the train, uh, of a, the roar of a train meant bad wind and it was coming for him. God, he thought, at the top on top of the moose now this but it was too late too late for anything in the strange stillness he looked at the night sky and turned back from his shelter and was leaning over to go through the open woods when it hit the open door opening when it hit later he would think about it and find that just the same as the moose just insanity he was taken in the back by some mad force and driven into the shelter on his face slammed down on the pine boughs of his bed at the same time the wind tore at the fire and sprayed the coals and sparks and the cloud around him. Then it backed out, seemed to hesitate a moment, and momentarily returned with a massive roar, a roar that took his ears and his mind and his body. When he whipped against, he, he was whipped against the front wall of the shelter like a rag, uh, felt it ripping pain through his ribs again, and he was hammered back down into the sand once more when the wind took the whole wall, his bed, the fire, his tools, all of it, and threw it into the lake. Gone out of sight, gone forever. He felt a burning on his neck, reached up to find the red coals there. He brushed those off, found more in his pants, brushed those away, and the wind hit again. Heavy gusts, tear, tearing gusts. He heard trees snapping in the forest around, his, around the rock. His body, felt his body slipping out and crawled at the rocks to hold himself down. He couldn't think. He just held and knew that he was praying and didn't know what the prayer was and knew that he wanted to be, stay and be, and the wind moved to the lake. Brian heard the great roaring, sucking sounds of the water and opened his eyes to see the lake torn by the wind. A water slamming in great waves it went through and always fought each other and then rose in a spout of water going up in the night sky like a wet column of light. It was beautiful and terrible at the same time. The tornado tore one more time at the shore in the opposite side of the lake. Brian could hear the trees beginning being ripped down, uh, and this was being done, gone and rapidly as it had come. It left nothing, nothing but Brian in the pitch dark. He could find nothing of where his fire had been, not a spark, nothing of his shelter, his t tools or bed, even the body of the fool bird was gone and i am back to nothing he thought trying to find things in the dark back to where i was when i crashed hurt in the dark just the same as if to emphasize his thoughts the mosquitoes with the fire gone and protective smoke no longer saving him came back in thick nostril clogging sweat clogging swarms all that was left was his hatchet at his belt still there but now it began to rain in the downpour, he would never find anything dry enough to get a fire going. At least he pulled his battered body under the overhang where the bed had been, wrapped his arms around his ribs. Sleep didn't come, didn't come with the insects ripping at him, so he lay the rest of the night, slapping mosquitoes, chewing with his mind, almost uh, mind on the day. The morning had been fat, well, almost fat, happy for sure, 
with good weapons and food and the sun in his face and things going good for his future. Inside of one day, just one day, he had been run over by a moose and a tornado and had just lost everything and was back to square one, just like that. A flip of some giant coin and he was a loser. But there was a difference now, he thought. There's a real difference. I might be hit, and I'm not, but I'm not done. When the light comes, I'll start to rebuild. I still have the hatchet, and I have all I had in the first place. Come on, he thought, burying his teeth in the darkness. Come on, this is the best you can do. Is that all you can hit me with, a moose and a tornado? Well, he thought, holding his ribs and smiling, spitting mosquitoes out of his mouth. Well, that wasn't going to get the job done. That this that was different now. That was the difference now. He had changed. He was tough. I am tough where it counts. Tough in the head. In the end, right before the dawn of a cold winter snap, a cold winter snap came down. Something else new. The cold snap and the mosquito settled back into the damp grass and under the leaves where he could sleep, or a doze. He at last thought that that morning, as he closed his eyes, I hope the tornado hit the moose. <laughs> When he awakened, the sun was cooling, was cooking inside of his mouth and had dried his tongue to leather. He had fallen into a deep sleep with his mouth open just after dawn and it tasted as if he had been sucking on his foot all night. He rolled up out and almost bellowed from pain from his ribs. The tightening in the night seemed to put his chest where he would move. He slowed his movements and so slowly without stretching unduly he went to the lake for a drink. At the shore, he kneeled, carefully and almost gently, in the darkness rinsed his mouth. To his right, he saw that the fish pond was still there, although the willow gate was gone and there was no fish. So I'll come back, he thought. As soon as I make a spear and a bow, I'll get one or two for bait and they'll all come back. He turned and looked at the shelter, saw that some of the wood from the wall was scattered around the beach, but it was still there, and he saw his bow jammed into a driftwood log, broken, but with the precious string still intact. Uh, not his, not so bad now, not so bad. He looked down at the shoreline for the other parts of his wall, and that's when he saw it. Out of the lake, in the shore part of the L, something curved and yellow was sticking six or eight inches out of the water. It was a bright color, not an earth or natural color, but for a second he could not place it, then he knew what it was. It's the tail of a plane, he said aloud, half expecting someone to hear him. There it was, sticking out of the water. The tornado must have flipped the plane around, and somehow, when it hit the lake, changed the position of the plane and raised the tail. Well, he thought, just look at that. And the same moment, cutting through it, they thought of the pilot, still in the plane, and brought a shiver of massive sadness and seemed to him like a weight, and thought that he should do something for the pilot some words. He didn't know any of the right words, the religious words. And so he went, uh, so he went down to the side of the water and looked at the plane and focused his mind the way he did everything else on hunting, fool birds and wanted to concentrate. He focused on plane thought, have rest, have rest forever.